Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Jolene Garber, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia in Okanagan in Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, Dr. Garber recently completed her PhD in microbiology with Christine Jemanski uh, at the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center and the University of Georgia. Um, and Christine was once a professor here at University of Alberta, so um, it's good to see uh, one of her students uh, coming to give a talk in the Glyconet series. And so with that, I'm going to hand over hopefully the uh, both the microphone and the uh, video feed to Jolene. All right, so just to start off, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for this opportunity to present to you today. And I will be focusing on some research that I did during my doctoral work at the University of Georgia under Christine Schumatsky's supervision on Campylobacter jejuni, chemotaxis, and metabolism of glucose. So to begin with, Campylobacter is a significant gastrointestinal pathogen. It's a gram-negative human pathogen that is found as a commensal in chickens. So many times people will get sick from it when they eat undercooked poultry or other contaminated food products. It's recently been identified as the leading cause of bacterial foodborne illness in the US as reported by the CDC and is a major cause of foodborne illness worldwide. Furthermore, 85% of infants in low to middle income countries have been found to be Campylobacter positive, which has been linked to growth sensing and mortality, indicating it's a serious problem. And furthermore, although generally Campylobacter infections are readily susceptible to antibiotic treatment. Um, they can lead to serious post-infection complications such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is now the leading cause of paralysis since the near eradication of polio. And also it has recently been listed on the World Health Organization's antibiotic high resistance priority list due to growing concern over chloroquinolone resistance in these species. Therefore, there is a need to understand more about them to try to develop new treatment and prevention strategies. My research focused on understanding more about Campylobacter in terms of understanding its um, nutrition. Therefore, I was looking at um, how Campylobacter obtains its nutrients. So traditionally, we thought of Campylobacter as being like this, this green bacterium drinking his amino acid protein shake because Campylobacter was believed to be asacrolytic, meaning it did not possess most of the enzymes required for traditional carbohydrate metabolism in the Entner-Deuteroff pathway. So it was believed to mainly use amino acids as a nutrient source. Um, so, however, since then, it has been identified that some subsets of Campylobacter do have the Entner-Deuteroff pathway on a genomic island and arm able to metabolize glucose. However, prior to that, our research group was able to identify a locus for the catabolism of fucose, and later my work showed that it could also be used for arabinose, which I'll get into as well. But we were primarily interested in fucose metabolism since fucose is quite abundant in the human gut. It can be found in the linings of our gastrointestinal mucins, and also it can be a component of the um, capsule polysaccharides of our gut commensals. It's also found in plant polysaccharides, found in fruits and vegetables that we consume. And of particular interest when looking at infections in children, it is a component of human milk oligosaccharides that you would find in breast milk. So the fucose locus in Campylobacter looks um, something like this where it has been identified in over 50% of sequenced isolates, including triple 168 and 1221, whereas other low strains that lack this low size, such as 81176, are just completely missing this locus. We were able to confirm that this locus is indeed functional, since when Campylobacter triple 168, a fucose utilizing strain, is is grown in minimal media compared to growth in minimal medium with supplementation with l -fucose. We see this growth enhancement as detected by this increase in OD. And this pattern is seen in other strains, including um, 
1221, whereas um, non fucus using strains such as 81176 do not show this enhancement in OD over time when supplemented with fucos. We're also interested in this, leuco this locus for fucose utilization since it appears to provide a competitive advantage in vivo. Um, in this piglet pathogenesis model, we co-inoculated the fucose permease mutant with the wild type at a one-to-one -one ratio and later counts for CFUs and calculating a ratio found that there was this competitive advantage for the wild type throughout regions of the piglet gastrointestinal tract, suggesting that fucose catabolism may play an important role in um, carbohydrate metabolism for this species and in pathogenesis. Fucose pathways have been described in other bacteria before. However, they are not completely homologous to Campylobacter. For instance, E. coli, um, and Bacteroides possess this pathway that moves through phosphorylated intermediates to catabolize fucose. And interestingly, Bacteroides can also incorporate fucose directly into its glycoproteins and lipopolysaccharides. However, we did experiments that indicated that Campylobacter was not using phosphorylated intermediates. Therefore, we um, became interested in the possibility that it might be using a pathway more like that by the plant pathogen Xanthomonas, where fucose is catabolized but does not rely upon phosphorylated intermediates. To begin with, my work focused on the L-fucose dehydrogenase, which catabolizes fucose, the first, that acts in the first step for catabolizing fucose. We were interested in confirming that the putative dehydrogenase in the Campylobacter locus CJ0485, or FUC-X as we've later named it, was a dehydrogenase. So we worked in collaboration with Al Baraston at the University of Victoria to crystallize this enzyme and determine its activity. You can see in this structure here that our fucose enzyme is shown in blue and that a homologue from Burkholderia multivorans can be found in yellow. And the structures are almost superimposable with the exception of this helix here. However, we think that this may be due to the fact that the homologue was crystallized with bound fucose, whereas for our crystal, we were only able to crystallize it with NADP, the cofactor in this um, predicted dehydrogenase reaction. So perhaps once fucose was bound, ours would be completely superimposable. We then were interested in um, determining if this Campylobacter fucx dehydrogenase showed similar activity to the Burkholderia multivorans homologue, since Burkholderia multivorans was able to um, catabolize L-fucose and also D-arabinose and L-galactose. Thus, we tested the activity of the dehydrogenase and found that it was indeed active to the highest level on L-fucose, but it also showed significant activity on D-arabinose. However, it did not have any strong activity on L-galactose or an additional library of aldose sugars that we also screened. We thought it was very interesting, though, that it was able to act on D-arabinose, since this would represent yet another carbohydrate that Campylobacter could potentially use. However, since the structure to fucose and arabinose is quite similar other than this methyl group on fucose, we wanted to verify that Campylobacter could use D. arabinose as a carbon source and not just that the enzyme could also um, reduce the sugar since they looked similar. So for this, we um, performed more growth experiments where we grew Campylobacter either in unsupplemented minimal medium or with um, added D. arabinose and indeed found that in the wild type triple one six eight fucose utilizing strain, there was also an enhancement in the presence of D. arabinose and that this enhancement was lost in most of the mutants in the locus, suggesting that the same enzymes used for fucose catabolism were used for D-arabinose catabolism. The few that also still showed enhancement with D-arabinose showed similar phenotypes with fucose, which suggests that the enzymes, although part of the locus, aren't crucial for the growth enhancement of the strain. We also had evidence that the same transporter for fucose um, import was being used for D-arabinose, since in this uptake experiment with radio-labeled fucose, 
where we compared uptake of um, a radio-labeled fucose into cells where either the pathway hadn't been induced or where the pathway had been pre-induced with fucose and saw this enhancement um, of uptake of radio-labeled fucose in the induced pathway and that this uptake of fucose could be inhibited by supplementing increasing amounts of diarabinose, in, of cold diarabinose rather, into the solution. So we just saw less fucose being taken up, indicating that the transporter was transporting the arabinose instead. So based on these growth experiments, as well as homology studies to other enzymes and characterized locuses, um, and verification of production of some of these metabolic intermediates, such as L-fuconic acid by NMR studies that we did um, with John Glushka at the CCRC, we were able to come up with this model for fucose catabolism. It's quite similar to the xanthomonas pathway. However, notably, it differs in the inclusion of this THDPS enzyme leading to a lactaldehyde intermediate. However, a pathway like this has previously been seen in the uh, archaeon, Sulfalobus sulfatericus. So you can see in this side-by-side um, -side comparison that the S. sulfatericus pathway is similar to the xanthomonas pathway in the first few steps where it doesn't rely on this phosphorylated intermediate and produces L-fuconate. However, in the later steps, it produces lactaldehyde similar to the E. coli pathway suggesting it's almost a sort of hybrid pathway, which is interesting to see. And to our knowledge, this was the first identification of this pathway in a bacteria. So it's a sulfatericus pathway and a cetogeni pathway. We were next interested in determining um, how Campylobacter is able to sense fucose in its environment in order to swim to it so it can metabolize it. And we developed this tube-based chemotaxis assay since traditional plate-based chemotaxis assays were tending to lead to false positives in Campylobacter. So in our assay, we have Campylobacter cells at the bottom of a tube, then a sterile layer of agar, and a test compound placed on a Wattman paper disc at the top of the tube. We then incubate the tubes for three days at 37 degrees Celsius under microaerobic conditions to best mimic the human gut. And then we add TTC to the tops of the tubes and allow for color to develop since um, TTC will turn this pink color if it gets reduced. So if Campylobacter cells have sensed the attractant and swam towards the top of the tube, they will be undergoing respiration near the TTC and we will see this color develop. However, if the cells have not been able to sense the fucose, or other test compound and swim towards it, we will see no color developing. So in this assay, what we did was we were able to see that the triple one six eight wild type strain is able to swim towards fucose. What we see is that the strains with the locusts were able to swim towards attractants, whereas eighty one one seventy six lacking this locus was no longer able to chemotax. And interestingly, we were able to determine that the FUC-X dehydrogenase was linked to this phenotype since um, chemotaxis was lost in the FUC-X mutant towards these attractants. However, interestingly, when we transfer either the whole locus or even just the dehydrogenase into the non-fucose utilizing strain 81176, we see chemotaxis conferred, which suggests that it potentially has a role in this um, response. However, work is ongoing to determine the mechanism for this. So changing gears a bit, I was also interested in determining if fucose utilization could influence Campylobacter adherence and colonization. So I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly in the interest of time, but there've been previous studies by David Newberg, which suggests that Campylobacter cells can normally bind to fucosylated structures in the gut, such as you see on this Chinese hamster ovary model um, that are fucosylated, and therefore that um, fucosylated oligosaccharides may be able to act as binding decoys so that the cells bind to those rather than adhering to the intestinal cells. And in their mouse model, they were able to see this 
reduction in Campylobacter colonization in the presence of fucose. Therefore, this suggests that potentially breastfeeding and providing those milk oligosaccharides may prevent against Campylobacter infection. However, when we looked at samples from the Global Enteric Multicenter study, which collected samples from children in seven low to middle income countries who were either breastfed or not breastfed and either showed diarrhea or did not show diarrhea, we were able to observe um, this high abundance of Campylobacter in these children and we're therefore wondering why this might be happening even when they're breastfed and if fucose utilization played a role. We thought that this could perhaps be that either the fucose metabolizing Campylobacter were using the fucose from the HMOs and therefore proliferating, or alternatively, that fucose using cells might be more likely to swim towards these HMOs and therefore be cleared from the gastrointestinal tract faster. And then other strains that don't have this fucose pathway, since it's only present in about 50% of strains, were consuming amino acids or other nutrients in milk and therefore proliferating without as much competition from other strains. When I surveyed the samples for their ability to use fucose, I found that there was this significantly lower proportion of strains able of to use fucose in the breastfed children, whether or not they showed any um, diarrheal symptoms. Whereas when they were not breastfed, it was about a 50-50, which you would expect if there was no effect from the fucose or milk oligosaccharides. Therefore, this is supportive of this binding decoy model where the fucose using strains are perhaps more likely to swim towards a decoy and be cleared from the system. However, ongoing work is happening in the lab to determine um, if indeed the fucose using strains bind structures more readily than the non-fucose using strains and also to determine then what nutrients the strains that can't use fucose are using instead. And so with that, I would like to, of course, thank Christine Shemansky and the other members of our research group who have helped a lot with this project from when I started it at the University of Alberta and later moved to the University of Georgia Complex Carbohydrate Center. I would also like to acknowledge my new research group who I've just gotten started with working for and have really appreciated their support with um, starting a new project and allowing me to present today. I would also like to acknowledge the Braston Lab for helping with the crystallography and enzymology. The Garrett Lab also helped with that. John Glushka was able to help with the NMR studies to confirm some of those metabolic intermediates. And this group at the University of Maryland School of Medicine helped with um, providing the GEMS samples for the breastfeeding study that I touched on at the end of my talk. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the funding sources that I've had um, throughout my doctoral program.